distinguished guests, uh, all protocol observed. Thank you so much for having me here today. As we get ourselves ready, I, I, I have to say that um, if you are feeling the spirit, I'm awestruck. To be on the same stage um, and to be surrounded by such wisdom and to hear these beautiful words coming through uh, tonight has just reminded me that I'm still learning, let alone the fact that I'm in a building and I hear words like Chancellor, Professor, and Lecture. So I'd like to welcome our two respondents to the panel. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier on, when uh, Professor, Professor Reisbeck was speaking, he talked about the fact that today is about taking a pause and reflecting. And um, I did stop and ask myself, is it not really about maybe stopping rethinking and redirecting? And I'm asking as a young person, I think, thinking on behalf of young people. I may not be exactly that young, but um, my question is, there are not many of them in the room today. And my understanding of the word lecture is about the fact that the lecture goes beyond the classroom. The lecture, is always, the public lecture, has also been about sharing uh, in, in a communal space and exchanging ideas and learning, and also going ahead uh, progressing the oral history, the, the, the oral history as such. Um, so, so today, I think uh, some words have been said. Swanile Kumaru spoke beautifully. Dr. Rensbeck also spoke. And words, uh, the words that resonated with all of us, and you were asked to respond to that. And when I asked you earlier on, you thought, you thought it was um, an imposition of some sort, sir? Well, good evening, friends, families, my daughters. Yes, know you where are you? Stand up so that they can see my daughter. <laughs> Also have my two channels here, Lucky. Thank you, Madam. So they bear witness. I think uh, the provocation to speak. I enjoyed uh, Professor Iron's input. We need copies of the <laughs> of that. Firstly, let me talk you to the man. Many years ago, I wish that Dr. Becher was here. <coughs> he ran to the bioscope where I worked as, um, as an usher. Raton, and the monkey like this, sir, or you, and the surround of the spine. Raton, Jimut Khan. So he ran. And there was my humor second. These gangsters around him. I say, you touch him, you die. You touch him, you die. Proton, and he was really. And then for the gangsters, hi, Proton, you know this is you. He thinks he's the god, he thinks he's the king. He will allow the chair is fat. So Don Matera says, hey, that biochem is a big dude. <laughs> leave him. The knives were already open. The trumpet was laying down there on the ground. <laughs> so I said, Sonny, stand up. I gave him a smack, took the, the trumpet, and I said, run. <laughs> so he walked. He never ran. He's got that swagger. <laughs> and then maybe after another 10 months, Pradon. So I said, you, I'm tired of saving your life. <laughs> he said, no, this is not just a life. This is a way of life. <laughs> so we wish him well wherever he is. And it is important <coughs> for us to speak about these anecdotes. We knew his father. We knew Barbara's father, we knew the family, and the contribution that this family has made is not a contribution that you flag, you feel. So we salute you, ma'am. 
We salute your family. We salute you and your brother. And we salute the children. So God bless you. And it's an honor for me to respond. My dear sister, I am a prophet of doom. Smongila touched me very much when she said, we have to talk, we have to speak, we have to say things. Some of us have shut our mouths because we are fine and we are happy. So this child, as Smongila's father, that I knew very well, has ignited in me to say to you, all is not well in the country. There is good, but all is not well. So my poem says, I see them. I see them every day, everywhere. Non-people in non-transition, moving, shifting, going nowhere. Trapped in twilight zones of vacuous expectation waiting between nothing and nothing. I see them, I know them. I am among them seeking veracity, but trapped on the periphery of foreign norms and values and doublespeak. Find them not in boardrooms of decision making, nor in marble halls or in fine dineries but in centuries of prayer, supplicating the void expanse for meaning, chanting dry their flaccid lungs, calling on gods who are not there, nor here, nor anywhere. I see them every day, everywhere, non-people in non-transition. I see them everywhere, a people who have been lied to. So this is me, and the, the spark comes, but not all is doomed. When people start to speak, when people start to say, it must make the wrong ones shiver that this was not what we fought for. This is not what we want. We must say to the world, Nelson Holishata Mandela smacked history in the face. Whack! Because history is about vengeance. It's about an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And yet those who kept us in bondage were allowed to continue their lives. Where else in the world does it happen but in Africa? So it is important for us to say to each other, the sense of tribalism is growing in our country, whether you like it or not. Mandela saved the whites. Who's going to save the blacks? So tonight must be the night when we engage the truth of who we are, what we are. We are not just an ordinary people. We are a people who have been chosen to give us birds that sing, men that write, teachers that teach, scholars and musicians that help to heal the wounds of our people. So all of us tonight must ask ourselves, am I doing my bit for my country? So to me, the question is clear. Another poem speaks it questions God, because every Sunday, when you switch on uh, television, it's the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Wherever you are, there's the advert for alcoholism, aimed at your children, aimed at your youth. Nobody says, give us an advert that says the dangers of alcohol. It's the castle light. It's this brandy. Uh, the guy comes from America, 
other one comes from uh, Britain to come and advertise whiskey in our country for our children. And we keep quiet and we don't say this is wrong. We will have nurtured a nation of drunkards. So you have to speak. You have to say like tonight, as he does, he blows his trumpet so that you may hear. And if you hear, then you must do. So for me, that is the question. I've always wanted to know from the Catholic Church, who is this God? Why is he so awesome? Why is he never smiling? Why must we sacrifice and confess our sins? And then I got to writing in 1954. Great God, I sometimes wonder how strong you are. What awful cosmic tension throbs inside your restless brain? Why? In the scheme of human conception, did you have to include pain? If only we could meet man to man, you stripped of power and I of fear. I would lift my shirt and show you scars. Why does the moon black as the stars? If only we could meet in the ghetto, in the street, you, God, stripped of the power of death and I of its fear. I'd walk away from you. And I know that you will cry to have me back. Perhaps I shall return to wipe your eyes. For who, who wants a God that cries? It is important for us to touch each other. There is no religion greater than compassion. And you say the wound, Ubuntu. Ubuntu all the time. Compassion is greater than all religions because the source of compassion is him, the king of kings. So it is important for us tonight to take this opportunity of you, Masi Keller's lecture, serious, because we might not pass this way again. At the age of nine, the nuns gave me a poem to read. I shall pass through this world but once. Any good therefore that I can do, any kindness that I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. Guys, this is the night of decision. Under the name of this man, under the ages of a great family, under the ages of another great family, Baga Kumar also. Ask yourselves, this country, are you happy the way things are headed now? Thank you, thank you, Bradon. Of riches, wealth, and powerful minds, of powerful voices that need not be facilitated. Oh, May I take the pleasure? Oh, beautiful, <laughs> Thank you, sir. May I take the pleasure of introducing Hot Sticks now Thank you. I don't know if it's me or it's a microphone. <coughs> Brad um, thank you once again. You know, when I was invited to come and be a respondent, I kept saying to Rax, what do you want me to do? What is a respondent? How do I respond? You know? And he said, no, no, we'll get to the documents, and we'll get to the documents, <laughs> read through the documents, and then from the documents you read, then you'll be able to respond. Come Thursday, I called, Rax, where are the documents? <laughs> You know, you, you're, you're actually given a task to deal with something that you've never really experienced. I mean, being a respondent to a lecture. I've never been into a lecture before. I'm just a matriculate, so. <laughs> I still have to wait you And I waited, and I waited. 
I was shivering, I was shaking, I was nervous. And I thought, who else is going to be there? But I don't mind that. I said, oh God. <laughs> How does Rex Rex do this to me? You know? You want to expose my weakness now. You bring such a brilliant orator mm -hmm. to speak. And what it, what is it that I would be going to say to people and responding to slowly this uh, speech? Russ, where's the speech? <laughs> Last night, I said, if I don't get the speech, I'm not coming. <laughs> and he says, oh, Sinisa calls me. He says, you know, Mutsipa, you are not the only one. Stoney is going through the same motion as you are. <laughs> you know? She is just as much struggling to understand what her role is going to be and what she's going to be writing and saying. And I thought, yeah, this is rather difficult. But we will send you documents later in the evening. And I think it was about 12 midnight when I, <laughs> I went back home and I went into my system and I, uh, I saw the documents. I was relieved. Now I had to start reading this English. So, oh, you know, Sloane they had written some um, wonderful words, and you have not disappointed Sloane It can only say where you come from, whose child you are, yes. whose daughter you are, oh, yes. whose sister you are, whose friend you are and the family and all the people that you've lived around and interacted with all, all your life is in all your speech. And for that I can say thank you yes. for representing us. <laughs> and of course, I'm expected to respond to all that. <laughs> that comes to be challenged. <laughs> But before I can say some of the things I wish to say, um, I want to say to Brahim, it's unfortunate that you always have to be defending Brahim. He seems to be attracting controversy all the time. <laughs> I read in the Sowetan today, <laughs> and I thought to myself, hey, man, Brahim. <laughs> you know, Trust me, wherever Rahim goes, however great music he makes, there will always be trouble following him. I remember we were in Zimbabwe at some stage, and you know when he, when he was busy with Mungeni trying to work out on there. Uh, you remember since Barbara when we were there, when you know, he was working with you, uh, with sorry, Mungeni to try and bring Sarafina to America and so on. So we went to this pub, you know, and in our nature of things, as musicians, we are always expected to behave in a particular way. We're supposed to be gentle people. We don't attract controversy. We don't fight. When someone wants to pick up a fight with us, we say, and please don't believe all the stories that were written about me. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you must discount all that stuff. <laughs> and I've always. I've always known that that is the people we are. But trust me, with Rahim, it's always a thing. J.K. Visons. You know, we have to try and, and defend situations that we always find ourselves in. So the article in, in, in the Soweto today didn't come as a surprise. But, okay, right, don't you dare tell you. <laughs> okay. I thought you always write this way. No. Are you still angry that you know how I write? <laughs> you must read it for this way to me. It's got some very interesting things. Um, sometimes he can be brash, but he can also be very funny. Very funny, extremely funny. He always makes fun of his sisters in particular. More than any other person. They bear that brand. In fact, his cousins who are here to eight, he just lashed at them all the time. And we all laugh at his jokes. And he's a very, very funny person. 
But when I read the article and I thought to myself, would it be correct for us to castigate Rahu for having said the things he says? Or should we engage him? Should we dismiss all the things he said about who we should be and what we should represent as a people? We need to reflect on that. And I believe many of the young people who are supposed to be here are probably thinking to themselves, but Ndadele is someone very, very special to us. And I came across uh, a piece that was written in a book by Gwen Ansel, and I quote, when some of my African-American friends come here and say, man, the thing that breaks my heart when I come here is I come to look for Africa. I find a cheap imitation of myself. I find a wannabe. You might wonder why we go look for animals in the Kruger Park. Instead, it's because we cannot find people, unquote. It is the last generation, the aged, who know our backgrounds and who we are. Brother Hugh has become a repository of the music and cultural information Africa needs to advance its own place in the annals of great music history. I went on to say, Rahu, when you signed your book for me, Still Grazing, you wrote, and I quote, my brother Sipo, thank you for, thank you for all the years of friendship, love, and generosity you have gifted me with thought, with, through the years. And he goes on to say, don't do the things I did. He says that to me in the book. I respond, Brahu, if I can do and achieve half the things you have done, I will have contributed as much to the continent as you have done. And I thank you for that, Brahu. Uh, thank you for those uh, for those words. Do you know, uh, two weeks ago, I, I personally got woken up by a jingle of a BBC <coughs> television program called Hard Talk. It was five o'clock in the morning, and uh, it was a wake-up call. And I, when I turned to look around, I found that it was an interview with Rahim. Little did I know that I'd be sitting here today, because as I was listening to this conversation unfold, I realized what you are talking about about the repository, about the stories that need to be shared, experiences, mm. a whole lot of things that Rahim can teach us and that he can share about ourselves that we don't even know much of or that he's been part of. And I, I, I ask myself the question, um, whose responsibility is it to go and get that, to go and get that, that memo? Whose responsibility is it to go and get all the information out and put it to the fore? Are young people interested? Do you know, when I was talking earlier on about uh, being surrounded by wisdom, I realized how fortunate we are that all of this is, is around us. And yet we talk about our young people who are aimlessly wandering the streets, and we talk about poverty and all of that. The question is, where is the chasm? Where is the glue? Who's going to provide the clue? It's not for me to answer those questions, but I think uh, given what we've just talked about, you know, the floor is open for a short while for anybody who'd like to share some message on tonight's lecture. So what do what do we want more? Okay. Um, okay. One of, uh, I'm sorry, I know someone might want to say something. Perhaps I, I just forgot to say something that, that I think is very critical, especially for us and many of the young musicians that have uh, interacted and probably performed with Brahim. I personally had, I don't know if Spokil probably had this, I had amazing experiences of getting to know 
how big that man is. Mm. And uh, we probably underestimate the power of who and what Maskela has done for this country through his music. Maybe I need to tell a little story. When I was in London, I used to live around a, a video shop and uh, he would come and visit every now and then. And one day we were walking past this store and I got acquaintance with the shop owners and so on. So I walk in there, it's a, a video shop and I walk with that, with Rahim into the shop. These guys were like, uh, is, that, is that you, Mascara? I said, yes. No, you, it cannot be. And these were young British kids. And they were responding to this great musician. And how do you know him, Mascara? I said, well, he's my friend. No, see, but don't, don't come up with a story, man. Don't come up with a story, man. You cannot be human scale, for you don't know human scale. And these guys asked me if they could get a picture with him. You know, with, with all these selfies, but then we didn't have selfies, of course. You know, we had these big cameras and stuff. And I said, no, he sees I me. Mean, you know, he'd come and take a picture with you. Now, in most cases, you know, when you take pictures, you pose like this. <laughs> His was like this. I still have the pictures. Every time I show him the pictures, he just laughs. These guys could not believe that Huma Sikela walked into their store. Now that's how big Rahim is. But also, the discipline of musicianship with Rahim was something that I got to experience. He invites me to his house in London. Hey, my little son, eat. So I get an impression that, oh no, we're going to have lunch and so on. We get to his house, he puts me in his library, he says, there are books, go and read. He goes into his studio for two hours, he starts practicing. <laughs> 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 and that for me was a great lesson. Because in most cases people would be saying, do you still practice? And I said, brother, do you still practice this? So brother, you has given so much to this industry in terms of just musical knowledge and all other aspects of our cultural, uh, what are the words? You know English sometimes, no meaning, come to Cultural reserves or privilege just come to our rescue. Thank you so much. That's just one of the points that I wanted to raise about the importance of us having to begin to appreciate some of our uh, legends that even though they don't like to be called legends, while they're still alive and being able to interact and share their own personal experiences with us, including young people, go out there, get the book, still crazy. Go and listen. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The University of Johannesburg. Rethink. Reinvent.